The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in St. Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians in the fifth chapter, the 21st verse. The 21st verse, the last verse in the fifth chapter of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now the verses that lead up to that are these. Let me read again from verse 17. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, we've been engaged on a number of Sunday nights in a study of this great chapter, and we are approaching it from a very practical standpoint. The apostle opens out with these words. He says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's been dealing with his ministry in the previous chapter and with his sufferings. And he's standing face to face with the fact of death. He says, if my body is actually ended, if I die, if my earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, it's all right, he says. The gospel that I believe enables me not only to live, but also to die. And to die without any fear at all. We know. He's not uncertain. He's not hoping. He goes on to say, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now then, I'm putting it like this. Surely, the most urgent question uh, confronting every one of us in this world tonight is just this very question that the Apostle considers here. People used to dislike sermons about death. They still dislike them. But you know you're living in a world in which you've got no choice. In a world with atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, you've got to, if you're wise, to consider this question for the very good reason today that you never know when it's coming. Now, it's no part of the preaching of the gospel to be alarmist, and I'm not trying to be alarmist, but I do know that the common charge against the gospel is that it's sob stuff, that it's pie in the sky, that it's evading the problems of life and of living, and uh, going into a realm of fancy and fantasy and imagination. Well, I'm just trying to show you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most practical thing in the world. I'm preaching to people who are living in this atomic age of which we are hearing so much. I'm preaching to people who know that these bombs are being manufactured by country after country and that the leading scientists are saying, well, that in 10 years or so, 12 nations at least will have them and then the possibilities, of course, are just such that they paralyze even the imagination. So I say the question of all questions at the present hour is this. How do you face such a future? How do you go on living in such an uncertain world? How do you feel about death? That's the question. The ultimate test of every teaching of every philosophy is that. That's the last question. I'm not depreciating the other questions. Living is important. 
Yes, but you know, dying is much more important because what lies beyond it? Well, there's an eternity beyond it. And we decide what happens to us there in this life and in this world. Very well then, here is the question of questions. If the earthly house of our tabernacle were dissolved, what then? Do you know? Do you know where you are? Can you envisage that without tremor, without alarm? Are you confident, always confident? Now that's the question. And you know the business of the gospel is to prepare us for that. What the apostle does in this chapter is to tell us how to arrive at this position at which he'd arrived. Thank God that he does so. That we've got a message here coming down nearly 2,000 years which helps us how to face the end of all things. Our own death, perhaps the end of the world. Here's the answer. Now then, we've been looking into it. How does it do it? Well, there it is. You see... To come to this position, you've got to undergo an entire change. The gospel's got nothing in common with all the other teachings. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This gospel is unique. There's nothing in the world like it this evening. You see, the secret of this is this. It doesn't tell you it'll change your circumstances. What it does tell you is that it can change you. That it can give you such a view of things that whatever happens to you, you're always confident. And you know that your eternal destiny is quite safe and sure. Now that's its position. Very well, and we've seen this. That involved in this great change is a man's entire outlook upon the whole of life in every respect. The apostle has been dealing with some of those earlier. He says, wherefore henceforth, now we know man after the flesh. He did once, but no longer. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Got an entirely new view of man, new view of Christ, new view of God. Everything is new. Yes, and there's one that I want to mention this evening which is also entirely new. And that is, he's got an entirely new view of salvation. What does salvation mean? Well, salvation is that which puts a man into the right relationship with God. Now, that's the whole secret. As God is God, and as we're all under God, and as we've all got to go and stand before God in the judgment, the most urgent question is, how can a man be reconciled to God? You see, it follows inevitably from everything we've been considering on the previous Sunday evenings. We've seen what we are. We've seen what God is. And we've seen the need of reconciliation. The great message is, be reconciled to God. We are at enmity with God. The natural man hates God. We were looking into that last Sunday night. He's against God. Why does God allow this and that? Now, I'm not disposed to answer that question. It's no part of my preaching tonight. All I'm reminding you of is this. If you are asking such questions, you are wrong in your attitude to God. You're looking at him after the flesh. You think that with your little mind, you can understand everything God does. And as long as you think that, you're regarding God after the flesh. But the moment you come to regard God after the Spirit and yourself also... You'll stop asking those questions. And you'll only have one question. And your one question is this. How can I be right with that God? How can I be reconciled to him? How can I come to know him? How can I be blessed by him? How can I know that when I do go on to eternity, I'm going on to be with him and to enjoy his glorious presence? That's the question. Now, it's a very old question, this. It was a question propounded by one of the earliest men of whom we read in the Bible, a man called Job. He put it, how can a man be just with God? That's the question. The question that was put, you see, in the hymn, a great and a profound question. Some of my friends on my left here were singing the tune and not the words. Did you notice they were rushing those first verses? Eternal light, eternal light. How pure the soul must be 
when placed within thy searching sight, it shrinks not, but with calm delight can live and look on thee. That's the question. Not to be rushed through, not to be lilted away with the tune, the most tremendous question. We betray our theology in our singing, don't we? We are to sing the words, not the tune. This is the greatest of all questions. How can a man, such as he is, be just with that holy God as he is? Now this, I say, is the question of all questions. And it's a question, says the Apostle here, concerning which a man undergoes an entire change when he becomes a Christian. Now, the Apostle himself, of course, he knew about this change. That's why I read to you that third chapter of his epistle to the Philippians at the beginning. Of all the changes which this man saw of Tarsus and a went, there was no greater change than his view of salvation. You remember, he says, if any man had a right to burst after the flesh, well, I'm that man. Hebrew of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, so on. Demands of the law, just, excelling beyond everybody. And he thought that he was right with God. But he tells us that afterwards he came to regard all this in which he'd bursted so much as but dung and refuse, useless. Now, that's the sort of revolution that takes place when a man becomes a Christian. His view of how to be reconciled to God and how to be saved is something entirely and absolutely different. Now then, let's look into this together. As we value our souls, as we realize the crisis in which we are living and how we have all got to face this question or soon or late, let's look at it together. Once more, I would indicate to you and remind you that there are only two ways, ultimately, of looking at this question of salvation. They're the same two. You can look at salvation after the flesh. You see, there are only two views. We look at everything either after the flesh or else after the teaching of this revelation. It's one or the other, always. There's no alternative. Well, now, of course, as we come to look at this view of salvation after the flesh... We shall find, as we've been finding in every other respect, that there is quite a variety of different views. Yes, but they all have a common denominator. Though they differ from one another, they're agreed in one thing, that they're viewing it after the flesh. Now then, let's have a look at them. The views which men take of salvation will, of course, inevitably depend upon their views on the previous questions. What's a man view of himself? What's a man's view of God? What's a man's view of Jesus Christ? When I hear his answers to those questions, I know exactly what is his view of salvation. And there is a consistency in it all. When people have got the wrong view of themselves and of God, well, they can't help themselves. Their view of salvation must inevitably be wrong. Nevertheless, I've got to put it before you. I've got to put it before you in order that you may test your view of salvation this evening. Do you know that you are rejoicing in the salvation of God? Are you reconciled to God? Is all well between you and God? Well, very well. If you say yes, I ask you, on what grounds do you say that? That's the question. Because there are false views of salvation. The apostle, as I've reminded you, thought that all was well with him, but he found it was all wrong. It's a very common thing, this. Now, that on what grounds do we feel that we are right with God, that we've got nothing to fear when we die, that we can stand in the judgment and that we are going to heaven? On what grounds do we believe that? Well, let's look at it together. It seems to me that we can divide up this matter into two main headings. The view of salvation after the flesh has got certain general characteristics. And then we must look at it also in detail. Let's take it in general first. What are the general characteristics of this wrong, this false view of the way of salvation? Well, the first and obvious characteristic is this. 
that it is regarded as something which is within the competence of man himself. Now, fortunately for us, our Lord has given us very wonderful teaching about this. And to make it still easier for us, he put it in the form of a parable. It is the parable that you'll find recorded in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, where he talks about two men going up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now the Pharisee is the man who's got the view of salvation after the flesh. You remember the story, don't you? He goes right forward to the front, and he stands up and he says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, and especially as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give a tenth of my goods to the poor. He thanks God for everything. All is well. Doesn't ask for mercy. Doesn't ask for forgiveness. Doesn't ask for compassion. Doesn't confess any sins or failures or faults. He is perfectly self-satisfied. He is quite content. All is well between him and God, he thinks. He rejoices in it and thanks God that it is so. Yes, but on what does he base it? Well, you notice, don't you? He bases it entirely upon what he is and what he has done. He fasts twice in the week. He gives a tenth of his goods to the poor. And it's because he's doing these things and he's such an excellent man that he knows that God is very well pleased with him. And he is so unlike this miserable publican who is a sinner. Now, there is the perfect view of uh, salvation as looked at with the natural mind, uh, what Paul terms after the flesh. What are its characteristics? Well, it scarcely needs any elaboration, does it? The first thing I say is that it's obvious that it is regarded as something which is within the competence of man himself. I fast twice in the week. He does it. His competence, his ability. Not only is it something within the competence of men, it isn't so excessively difficult, is it? He seems to have taken it in his stride. No difficulty. No agonizing, no groaning. A man like this, if he had read the life story of a St. Augustine or a Martin Luther, well, he wouldn't understand them. These men went through a sort of agony. Oh, he knows no agony at all. The thing seems quite simple. There's no problem here. All that is necessary is a certain amount of determination and of willpower and uh, the exercise of the faculties that we have. If a man makes an effort, if a man puts his back into it, he can do it. A man can reconcile himself with God. Of course he can. I thank thee, therefore, that I am what I am, and that I'm unlike this other man. Now, that's, there it is, our Lord's own picture. It isn't mine. And it is the perfect picture, of course. The story, the autobiography of the Apostle Paul confirms it to the hilt. He thought in the same way that he just had to live Life according to the teaching of the Pharisees and all would be well. And that was the teaching of all the Pharisees put together. And the offense of the Lord Jesus Christ, the thing for which they never forgave him, the thing which made them finally crucify him, was that he exploded the whole thing. It was their view of salvation that was wrong. And they realized that he was teaching that and teaching it very plainly. But now there is its general characteristic. It is something we can do. It's not exceedingly difficult. And all it demands of us is this exercise of our willpower and our effort. Very well. There it is in general. Let's look at it in particular. Now, when we come to look at it in particular, we shall, of course, be impressed by the varieties of different views and teachings which people hold. But, as I've already reminded you, though they differ on the surface, they're all one. They're all one in this fundamental attitude. But nevertheless, in order to search every heart that is in this congregation, I'm going to specify the details up to a point. Because God knows in the presence of the devil who is always here to rob us of the word of God, 
We must take nothing for granted. If our particular position isn't mentioned, we may never even think of it. We may think we're all right. It is a part of the business of preaching to search us out of our hiding places and to expose the whole thing to us. Here are some of the views, therefore. Strange though it may seem and though it may sound, there are still people who think, you know, that what makes you a Christian is that you're born in a particular country. There are some, therefore, who never think about this question. They just assume it. They assume that all is right. They've been brought up in this land, a Christian land, and of necessity, therefore, they must be Christians. I don't wait with this. Let me just note them to you. There are, I wonder, how many thousands, not to say millions, who really believe that because they were christened when they were children, they were made Christians. That's a very common belief, not only believed in by the members of the Roman Catholic Church, where, of course, it is specific teaching, but by many others in all the various denominations. They really believe that that act when they were children made them Christians. They believe that there is a kind of efficacy in a sacrament, as they call it, that a sacrament works to use their technical term ex opere operato, that whether you're conscious or unconscious, whatever the character of the priest, that somehow or another divine grace enters into that water and it enters into you and you become a child of God. I believe there is a phrase in the common prayer book of the Church of England which actually says that, that this child is now regenerate. Now there are many therefore who believe that they're Christians simply because they were christened when they were infants that that act made them Christians. There are others who believe that because they've been brought up in a Christian home, always brought up in a church or in the atmosphere of a church, taught to say their prayers, taught to read their Bibles, that that in and of itself makes them Christians. I'm only mentioning these things that we may examine ourselves. What are you relying on, my friend? Are you relying on any of the things I've mentioned so far? That's not the biblical teaching I want to show you. Then there are others who do indeed rely upon the sacraments in other ways. They not only believe that they were made Christians by baptism, but that that they go on eating the literal body of Christ in the communion service. This is not confined to Rome again. There are many others who believe this. They've adopted the teaching of transubstantiation. They believe that as the act of consecration is performed, that that Bread is turned into the literal body of Christ and that they're eating of him and receiving eternal life and are growing in it and are being strengthened. They rely upon the sacraments. In the same way, there are large numbers who rely entirely upon what the church does to them. They're relying upon the church. The church christens them, feeds them, teaches them. It does everything. And their reliance is upon the church. Many are relying upon dead saints. They rely upon all sorts of agencies outside themselves. Well, now, there are some views. But then there are others who are not in that position at all. There are people who take up this attitude. They say, surely, all that is necessary for a man to be a Christian All that is necessary for a man to be able to think of God without fear and to die without a tremor is that one avoids sin, that one mustn't do certain things, and on the other hand, one must do good. Surely they say that's what Christianity really is, that's what God demands, that a man does good. There's a lot of suffering in the world. What's a man doing to relieve that? Is he contributing towards good causes? Is he helping people to do the work? Does he perhaps get up and do it himself? This is the notion. I mustn't keep you with these negatives, but you know this is, I think, of all the views of what it is to be saved and the means of salvation. I think this is the commonest of all. There are men being lauded by the newspapers and other agencies as outstanding Christians. And you say, well, why do you say that man's a Christian? They say, look what he's done. He gave up a great career. He's forsaken certain possibilities. It's all the emphasis upon what the man has done. And this is the old teaching, that you justify yourself by works, 
It is what Paul thought before his conversion. There are thousands thinking it today. They say it doesn't matter what you believe, it's what you do. Are you doing good? Are you relieving the poor? Are you helping the suffering? Are you making sacrifices? Are you a benefactor? Are you benevolent in your whole attitude? That's the thing that makes a man a Christian. You avoid sin, you do good. And they're very fond of putting it like this. That what is necessary is to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. They say he went about doing good. And the Christian is a man who goes about doing the same thing. Anybody who's anxious to imitate Christ is a Christian. They say it doesn't matter what their view is of his person. It doesn't matter whether they believe in his deity and in his virgin birth or not. Now, I'm not imagining these things. These things are being preached. These things are found in books. You'll find them in religious articles. You'll find them in the, com the popular press. This is Christianity. Christ was a man who went about doing good. We've gone into that, haven't we? So the argument is that if you want to be right with God, you imitate Christ. The imitation of Christ. You set out to live as he lived. This life of goodness and of benevolence and of kindness. And then covering it all. There is this reliance upon the love of God and upon God's forgiveness. Why, they say, your view of God is such that you turn him into a monster. They say any human being is ready to forgive and to be compassionate. If a little child has done something wrong, if it says it's sorry, of course it's forgiven. And is God, they say, unlike that? Is there anything necessary, anything demanded more than that we should say that we are sorry if we sin or go astray or if we are aware of deficiencies? Is there anything more demanded than that we confess it and obviously the love of God will pardon and forgive it? Now, that's their view. You do your best. But if you fail, the love of God covers you. There is great forgiveness and compassion with God, and everything is all right. But then you say, if that is so, well, where does the Lord Jesus Christ come in? If all that is necessary is that a man lives a good life, and that, well, God's love will cover his deficiencies and put him all right at the end, where then... Is the necessity for Jesus Christ. What does he do? Ah, oh, they say what he does is this. He, above everybody, is the one who taught us about the love of God. That Old Testament had got a very severe view of God, a very legalistic view of God. But they say we don't believe in the God of the Old Testament. We believe in the God of Jesus. And Jesus, according to them, just came into this world to tell us about the love of God. They say, you know, the whole trouble in the world tonight is that people don't know about the love of God. They're fearful and unhappy and are failing and are afraid of death. Well, they don't know about the love of God. The love of God covers everybody. Everybody's going to be all right at the end. There's no problem. If it, it's just the problem of ignorance. People don't know about the love of God. And what Christ came into the world to do was to tell us about the love of God. Not only that, he came to teach us how to live. He came to give us an example. He came to give us a stimulus. There he is, and all we've got to do is to listen to him and to rise up and to follow him. And all is well. Do your best. And then when you fail, trust to the love of God. That is the view of salvation. After the flesh. You get it described in the Bible. You find it in the whole long history of the Christian church. It is, I say, as common tonight as it has ever been. Now, my friend, here is the vital, the crucial question. What's your view of this? What's your view of being right with God? What if you had to die tonight? What are you relying on? That's the question. You may die tonight. You don't know. What if one of these bombs is let off at any moment? What if this... The present problem about Berlin becomes a world war and the end may come to many of us. What are you relying on? How are you going to meet God? That's the question. Are you relying on any one of the things I've mentioned? If you are, you are viewing salvation after the flesh. Let me prove it to you. Which brings me to my second section. What is the view of salvation after the spirit? 
What is the biblical view of salvation? What is the revelation of God himself with regard to this vital and all-important matter? Let me summarize it for you. Again, of course, we shall find that it follows with a logical necessity from all our previous considerations. You know there's a unity in this gospel. There is a logical development and sequence here. That's why, you know, I don't hesitate to say this. A man must be right on every point in connection with salvation. Ah, but you're narrow if you say that, they say. You say that you alone are right, and if everybody doesn't dot your I's and cross your T's, that is wrong. My dear friend, this is a whole, and you can't pick and choose here. That's the point I've been emphasizing for six Sunday nights. This is a whole, it is a complete system, it is a circle, and you've got to believe in every point of it. Your view of yourself, your view of God, your view of Christ, your view of salvation. They all go together. Let me show you them. And here the thing that strikes us immediately is the unanimity. There is only one way. Now I want to assert that. In this modern world that dislikes that sort of statement. Yes, in this modern church that dislikes that sort of statement. Let's have a congress, they say, of world faiths. Oh, of course, the Christians must be there, but so must the Mohammedan, so must the Hindu, so must the Confucian, so must your Unitarian. Congress of world faiths. I have only one thing to say about it. That is a denial of the Christian doctrine of salvation. There is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. There's only one. And you say that you want to add anything to him, you're denying him. The only one, the one and only mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Unique. Alone, no addition, no supplement. Make any proposal to add to him and you're denying him altogether. He stands alone. There is only one way of salvation. That's the first statement. Very well, having said that, let me adopt the same subdivisions as I did in the first section. Let's take a general view of it. You remember, don't you, that the general view of salvation after the flesh was that it was within the competence of men, that it wasn't too difficult, and that all it needed was willpower and effort and determination. What of this? Well, now then, here it is. This is the greatest of all problems. Now, I'm making a strong statement, but I'm going to repeat it. It is the greatest of all problems. Because of that, of course, it follows that I must say this immediately. It is utterly impossible to man in his own strength. That's the first statement of the gospel. Do you remember the men who came to our Lord on one occasion and said, Who then can be saved? You remember what made them ask the question? The rich young ruler had just been. And he was a beautiful young man. I believe he was a very handsome young man to look at. And to boot, he was a very moral young man. He is reminded of the commandments. He says, all these have I kept from my youth upwards. But you remember that he was a young man who went away sorrowful. Good, noble, excellent, moral, religious, kind, benefactor. And yet when confronted by the challenge of the Lord Jesus Christ, he went away sorrowful. And the poor disciples looking at him going turned to our Lord and said, Who then can be saved? If that man can't save himself, who can be saved? And back came the answer, With men it is impossible. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. Now then, here is my first statement. And it's an absolute statement. It's a crucial statement. No man can or ever has or ever will save himself. All our highest and our best efforts are utterly useless. 
the religion, the righteousness, the morality of a soul of Tarsus. And he was outstanding in every department. He is nothing but dung. It's manure. It's refuse. It's foul. It's stinking. All our righteousness is but as filthy rags. Now, the best, not the worst. The highest, the best efforts. All the striving of men who have segregated themselves out of life and have given themselves to living religiously and to please God, it is all utterly and entirely useless. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite no? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Oh, how can I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is dim, before the ineffable appear? And on my naked spirit bear that uncreated beam. You're not passing the test of men, but the test of God. You know something about the penetrating power of x-rays, revealing things that you can't see with the naked eye. Multiply that by infinity and infinity and infinity, and there is the eye of God upon you and your life and all your goodness, and it's vile. Or take your high-powered microscope. And there you look at a little bit of material. It seems quite quiet to you. Look at it under a powerful lens. And you see that it's full of bugs and germs and all sorts of creeping things. Well, I say multiply that again by infinity and there you are under the eye of God. So the first statement is this, that this is something that is altogether and entirely outside the competence of men. That poor Pharisee, in his whole attitude as he stands up and says, God, I thank you, has damned himself already. Any man who thinks that he can save himself or that salvation is the result of human effort automatically puts himself entirely outside. He's misunderstood the first thing. No, no. This, I say, is not only something that no man can ever achieve. It is the greatest of all problems in the whole universe. There never has, there never will be a problem that is equal to this. This is a problem which makes the problem of creation nothing. All God had to do in order to create this great universe in which we live with all its myriads of beings and all the variety of life within it, all that God had to do was to say, let there be light, and there was light. By the word of his power, he created the sun and the moon and the stars, animals, flowers, nature, everything, just by a word, his fiat, and it was all done. That was a great problem, wasn't it? The problem of creation. But my dear friend, that was a very little problem when you put it by the side of the problem of salvation. Here I say, and I'm speaking with reverence and very deliberately, here is a problem that even tested the mind and the ingenuity of God himself. How do you know that, says someone? Well, I'll tell you. I know that because of what I'm told in this book. I know that because of what God has done. In the matter of creating the world, all God had to say was, do this, let there be, and there was. Why doesn't he do the same in the forgiveness of sins? Why doesn't God, when a man comes to him and says, I'm sorry, why doesn't he just say, thou art forgiven? Why didn't he do that? But he hasn't done that. And he hasn't done that because, I say again with reverence, he couldn't do that. Why not? Well, because the problem is so great. Let me hurry to it. The problem of forgiveness, the problem of man's reconciliation with God is as great as this. 
that it necessitated everything that God has done in Christ. Here it is, isn't it? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It was the only way to do it. All that I'm going to remind you of now that happened in the Lord Jesus Christ had to happen. It couldn't happen in any other way. God cannot just say, I forgive you. If he could do that, he'd do that. But he hasn't done that. What has he done? Well, he's done all that is described in the pages of the Gospels and all that is elaborated in the teaching of these epistles. The whole way of salvation in Christ Jesus. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Why was this necessary? Now then, here's the answer. The problem of salvation, the problem of forgiveness, the problem of men's being reconciled to God is the greatest problem in the universe for one reason only. And that is because of the nature of God. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is just, God is holy, God is pure. Evil and sin can't exist near him. You see, it's like putting something in the light of a blazing sun. You've read of people recently, they looked at that eclipse, didn't they, without protection, and their eyes were permanently damaged. You can't look at the sun without receiving damage because of the light and the power. Well, again, I say multiply that by infinities. And there is a man looking at God. And for men, as he is to look at God, it means his destruction. The holiness of God. That's the cause of the problem. Yes, you see, our hymn had it. Eternal light. Eternal light. The father of lights with whom is no variableness. Neither shadow of turning. You and I can pretend we haven't seen things, haven't we? We often do that for the sake of harmony. We pretend we haven't seen a thing. God can't do that. No, no, God can't do that. God is perfect. God is the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, and neither shadow of turning. God can't sin. God can't lie. The Bible tells me that the character of God proclaims it in and of itself. God can't pretend. God is, and he's everlasting glory and holiness as we've seen. And because of that, the problem of sin is the greatest problem of all for God. For here is the problem. How can God forgive sin and still remain God? How can he be just and yet the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus? How can God punish sin as he must because of his nature and get rid of it and still get the sinner to himself? That's the problem, you know. Have you ever realized that that is the problem? The problem is entirely from God's side. How can God forgive? That's the question. And if you've thought it's an easy question, oh, your ignorance is almost beyond description. How can God forgive? The problem confronted God before the foundation of the world. And we are told that he found the only solution and the only answer to it. And the answer is in Christ Jesus. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. What has he done? Well, this is what he's done. He couldn't do it by speaking a word from heaven. No, no, this is what it necessitated. It necessitated the incarnation. Why was the Son of God ever born as that babe in Bethlehem? Let me put it bluntly. What was he doing in the virgin's womb? Is this play acting? Is this just to produce a spectacle? The Son of God, the everlasting Son of God, the second person in the Blessed Holy Trinity, he was in reality in the virgin's womb and was born as a babe. Why? Why did that most stupendous thing that's ever happened happen? And I say there's only one answer. It had to happen before you and I could be reconciled to God. Here he is when the fullness of the times was come. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. He who had made everything humbles himself. 
lays aside the signs of his glory, becomes a little babe, is born in the likeness of sinful flesh, he is there in utter helplessness and weakness. Why? There's only one answer. He's going to be our representative. And he can't represent us unless he becomes a man. He's got to take on human nature. He can't represent us as God, for it's man who sinned. It is therefore man who must deliver. But if a man tries, he's not pure. He's already sinful. And he can't do it. He can't save himself. He can't save any others. God saw the only way. His own son has got to take on human nature. He's got to be born as a man. Therefore, you see, he is made of a woman. He is made under the law. Or as you'll find it in Hebrews 2, he stretches out a helping hand not to, the, not to angels, but to the seed of Abraham. Because his brethren are made of flesh and blood, he also himself took part of the same. Why? Well, that he might be our representative. Now, this is the problem of salvation, you see. It demanded the Son of God leaving heaven, coming down to us. Ah, oh, but you say salvation is quite simple. All I do is to do my best and then God forgive. No, no. The problem is as awful, as tremendous as this. It needs the coming down of the Son of God in the incarnation. And he's come. That he might represent us, I say, and do something for us that he alone could do. But that's only the beginning. Here he is, he's come. What's he got to do? Well, you see, the law is there against us, God's holy law. And God's law must be fulfilled. The law of God is not something that you and I know about and then don't keep. It's got to be kept. He that doeth these things shall live by them, said God through Moses when he gave the law. Very well, the law is still there, and that is the demand of God. God asks of you, every one of us this evening, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. Now, that's not a figment. That's not a legal figment. That is God's demand. And God deserves that. He is worthy of that. He wants us to worship him with the whole of our being. He's asking that of you. Have you done it? Are you doing it? The Son of God was born of a woman, born under the law in order that he might keep the law of God for us. God's law has got to be kept. It's got to be honored. It has got to be kept in every jot and tittle, in every detail. It's got to be kept perfectly and absolutely. And he came down and was made as a man in order that he might give a perfect obedience to his Father and to his holy law. And he did it. But it had to be done before we could be reconciled. But, oh, my friends, he doesn't stop there. Because the trouble with us is not only that we have not lived and kept God's law, we've actually broken it. We are guilty before it. We are under its condemnation. We are therefore under the wrath of God. And the law of God, I say, doesn't play fast and loose with itself. God doesn't say he's going to do a thing and then not do it. That's you and die. And fancy the monstrosity of taking our little love, as we call it, and saying, God must be still greater like that. We say, now I'm going to punish you if you do that to a child. The child says, I'm sorry, we don't punish him. You know, God cannot do that. Have you realized that? God cannot do that. What God says, God does. He must do. His nature is such that he can't go back on it. And he has said that he'll punish them. And he must punish them. And we are all guilty before God. We've broken his law. We are transgressors. We are rebels before him. So it wasn't enough even that the Son of God should have come into this world and taken to him human nature and render a perfect and an absolute obedience to the law of God. Something has got to be done about that broken law. Something has got to be done about our transgressions, about our guilt. And blessed be the name of God, it's been done. What is it? Well, this is what's been done. Listen to this. For God hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Listen to it again being put like this. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for 
all. Then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What's it mean? Well, my dear friend, let me put it as simply as I can. It means this. And this is the essence of the gospel message of salvation. This is the eternal opposite of all that other teaching which says, do your best and God forgives you. No, no. No, no. If you believe that, you're denying God of the most glorious thing he's ever done. God so loved the world that he gave gave to the death and the cross, which means this, God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. What's it mean? It means this. There is the Son of God. He's never sinned. He's perfect. He's absolutely pure. He's obeyed his Father's will in everything. He's left nothing undone. He's never broken the law. He's abs- he knew no sin. Well, what's happening? Well, God is making him to be sin for us. What's it mean? It means this. Not imputing their trespasses unto them, I read here. It means this. He has taken your trespasses and your sins and mine, and he has imputed them to him. God's got a record. There is an account book. And everything you and I have ever done, it's in the book. There are our sins. There's our guilt. What has God done? Well, he's taken it off our book and it's put it onto his book. He's made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what he's done. He's taken your problem of guilt and mine. He's taken all our sins and transgressions and failures and faults. And he's put them on him. He's made him responsible for them. The son was in absolute agreement. It wasn't against his will. He volunteered to do it. He said he'd come and do it. And there it is. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's what's happening. The problem of salvation, the problem of forgiveness. It meant that, you see, there's no other way but that. God can't say, yes, I forgive you. No, no, his justice is involved. He must punish sin. And he has punished sin. But he punished it in his son instead of in you. He has laid on him the iniquity of us all. One died for all instead of, in the place of. He became our substitute. He became our representative. The Old Testament, you see, foreshadowed this. It pictured this. Don't you remember how they took an innocent lamb and then they slaughtered the lamb? What was the object? Oh, it was a prefiguring of what Christ was going to do. So says John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God hath made him to be sin for us. God laying on him the iniquity of us all. God punishing him that you and I might be freely forgiven. That is the teaching, you see, that is God's way of salvation. Imputing our trespasses unto him, putting them to his account and dealing with them in in him once and for all. And I've given you the reason for doing it. It had to be that way. That's why I say it's the greatest problem that has ever confronted heaven and God. It's as great as this, that the only way of solving it is that God's innocent son should die for the sinner and bear the punishment that you and I so richly deserve. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. No man can ever reconcile himself unto God. It is God who reconciles us unto himself. And his way of doing it is the only way that can do it, in and through his dearly beloved, only begotten Son. Very well, then, what do you and I do about it? Where do we come in? My dear friend, it's simple, it's plain, it's this. You and I are asked to do nothing except to believe that message. That's all. You are asked to believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God and that he came into this world because you were irretrievably lost and damned and hopeless, couldn't save yourself. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And all you and I are asked to do is to believe that. 
to look at him, the Lamb of God, to listen to the preaching. Be ye reconciled to God. Behold, behold the Lamb. And seeing him surrender, submit yourself to him. Believe the message concerning him. You know what happens when you do that? I'll tell you it's all here. You become joined to him. And therefore the apostle puts it like this. You are joined to him. You are linked to him. Everything he's done, you've done. With the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then all died. You see, this is the marvelous thing. The punishment, the wages of sin is death. I have sinned. I must receive the punishment, the wages. But how can I do that? I have already done it. I am in Christ. If any man be in Christ, my believing on him makes me one with him. So when he died, I died. My sins have been punished. When he died, I died. He was punished, I've been punished in him. And therefore God freely forgives me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That's the Christian way of salvation. That just as you are, not deciding that you're going out to live a better life and to read your Bible and to pray and to join a church and thereby make yourself a Christian. No, no. If you say that, you're outside. It's just this. That you see that you've got nothing to do except just as you are in all your failness, failure and sinfulness and shame to see the truth about what God was doing for you in Christ, to believe it, and to know that you're immediately forgiven, that you're immediately clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God from that moment looks upon you as if you had never sinned at all. Not only that, he makes you a new man, a new creature, gives you a new nature, makes you his son, adopts you into his family, begins to shower his blessings upon you, and at the end will receive you into glory, not because of what you've done, but because you are clothed with the robe of the righteousness of his only begotten, dearly beloved Son. Do you believe the message of reconciliation? God was in and through what happened in Christ, reconciling you unto himself. Do you believe it? Do you believe that he's made him to be sin for you who knew no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him? If you do, you'll never rely again on yourself or anything you've done in any shape or form. It is entirely, utterly, altogether in Christ and in him alone. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.